So my visual politic amigos, Tanzania is in the news for two reasons. Yeah, that's right, you heard us. Tanzania. And there's one good reason, and then there's one bad one. The good news is that this East African country is holding presidential and parliamentary elections on October 28th. An election that could end the reign of John Magufuli, president of the country since he won elections in 2015. But the bad news is that his presidency has been a steamroller over the rights and freedoms that previously existed in Tanzania. We are talking about extreme violence against opponents, strong political repression and limited freedom of expression for anything other than praise and commendations for the current president. So, as you might be able to imagine, this is something that makes us doubt that we are going to see fair and true elections. It seems likely that they'll be rigged in some way while Magafuli is in power. I'm sorry to say, but the truth is that, in this case, we are pessimistic. And although we don't know what will happen in the near future, we can pretty much imagine it. In any case, what we do know is that the political instability caused by Magafuli has also had economic consequences. And take note, because this is important. Yes, yes, some of you may be thinking, Tanzania? But what are you saying, Grant? I mean, come on, what did you expect? But here you may be skeptical, but we at Visual Politic, we actually like to be optimistic. And I'm aware that it's 2020 and optimism has been cancelled. But we do try. And the truth is that, in this case, there are many reasons to be optimistic. The 21st century started well for Tanzania, with many years of strong economic growth. The country was situated in the band of countries that make up the so-called New African Awakening, that we've already talked about in other videos about Ethiopia or Rwanda. However, since Magafuli came to power, it seems that Tanzania is not doing so well anymore. It's all gone downhill so badly that the IMF questions the economic growth figures provided by the government. So the question today is, why has the political situation in Tanzania deteriorated so much? Are the suspicions about the figures provided by the government justified? Today on Visual Politic, we are going to answer these questions. But first, let's take a look at some history. African Socialism You may have heard of places like Dar es Salaam, Tanganyika, or Zanzibar. So I suggest you take note, because the historical nuances are very interesting. Take a look. To begin with, Tanzania is the union of two states that had once been independent, Tanganyika and Zanzibar. Tanganyika is the name of one of the most important lakes in the world. Lake. Tanganyika. But when we refer to the Republic of Tanganyika, we mean the current continental Tanzania. Tanzania is located on the African continent between Lake Tanganyika and the Indian Ocean. Zanzibar is an archipelago on this same ocean formed by several islands and islets. And, my friends, you can't talk about Tanzania without talking about the great European explorers of Africa. The famous meeting between Henry Stanley and Dr Livingston took place in the interior of this very country. But it was not the first time that a European had visited these lands. The Europeans had already been going to Zanzibar centuries before, until the Sultan of Oman threw them out. At that time, the Omanis dominated the entire Indian Ocean coast, from Oman to Madagascar. This was so much their territory that in the 18th century, the Sultan moved his capital from Oman to Zanzibar. The problem was that his children got along worse than Scottish people did with English ones, or Scottish people with American ones, or Scottish people with French ones. Basically, I'm saying Scottish people are grumpy, and so were the Sultan's kids. So one branch of the family inherited the Sultanate of Zanzibar, and promptly cut off ties with their Arab relatives. In this way, the Sultanate was fully independent for more than three decades, until, surprise surprise, the British Empire took over. By the way, this Sultanate also owned the entire east coast of the African continent. So you can see why the most important city in Tanzania is called Dar es Salaam. It was an exemplary country until a few years ago in terms of religious coexistence. Nevertheless, Christianity still has a strong presence there, sometimes even an exaggerated one. Tanzania's leader urges people to worship in throngs against coronavirus. President John Magufuli scorns social distancing, sees Jesus Christ as antidote to satanic virus. Wall Street Journal. Meanwhile, Mainland Tanzania was colonized by the Germans and then became a British protectorate. This was the case until 1961, the year Tanganyika gained independence. And then, two years later, in 1963, came the independence of Zanzibar. But, my friends, the situations were very, very different. 
While Tanganyika was a multi-party republic during the first year, Zanzibar returned to the hands of the Sultan and a powerful ruling Arab elite. However, the independent Sultanate of Zanzibar lasted only one year month. A revolution broke out almost immediately, deposing the Sultan and founding the People's Republic of Zanzibar. And, as you can imagine, that peoples doesn't exactly always mean freedom. The country was about to become yet another experiment with communism. However, its president, Abid Karume, although a left-wing type, was more moderate. He didn't want a communist dictatorship and found a formula to avoid it, uniting Zanzibar with Tanganyika to form a new country. Tanzania. To do this, he had to get along with the man considered to be the father of the Tanzanian nation, Julius Nereri, a professor and the architect of African socialism. Someone who had a very unusual concept of democracy. Democracy is not a bottle of Coca-Cola, which you can import. Democracy should develop according to that particular country. I never went to a country, saw a lot of parties, and assumed that it is democratic. Julius Nyerere. With this starting point, as you can perhaps imagine, Nereri and Karumi shared the power. They reached a clear and simple agreement. Nereri would be president of Tanzania, and Karumi its vice president. In addition, Karumi would also be the president of Zanzibar, which was becoming a semi-autonomous region. That was the pact. But my friends, Nereri's plans for the new Tanzania didn't end there. And it must be said that the result was not very different from what had been planned for Zanzibar. But that had come about, as he promised, without aligning himself with the Soviet Union. Well, the fact is that African socialism marked Tanzania's first two decades. Nereri declared a one-party state, nationalized companies and factories, and forced 11 million peasants to work on collective farms by force, burning their homes to keep them from returning. As is often the case when you force people who have no idea what they're doing to work in the fields, these farms were a complete failure. The result was a massive famine, and despite Tanzania's enormous potential, there was real economic chaos. And at that time, loans from the International Monetary Fund helped that country get out of the situation. But, as always with a bank, the fund set conditions. And for once, they didn't ask for anything particularly controversial. The country basically had to open up to the free market. This was a change that Nereri did not want to accept. So in 1985, he understood that his time as president was over. At the age of 63, he retired and went home. Undoubtedly one of the best decisions of his entire political career. His voluntary departure allowed changes to come to the country. In 1994, multi-party democracy was restored in Tanzania. And, my friends, Tanzania has since become one of Africa's favourite countries for investors. As state control over the economy relaxed, investment began to roll in. Tanzania attracted direct foreign investment that accounted for 4% of its GDP annually. Not an inconsiderable figure. For decades, the United Kingdom and the United States were the main investors. Until recently, of course, when everything changed. China emerges Tanzania's major investor, Ventures Africa. The point is that, regardless of where the money comes from, all this investment has had consequences. Tanzania's economic situation has improved and its per capita income has doubled so far this century. Moreover, as you can see in this graph, Tanzania's annual GDP growth has not stopped increasing and over the last 20 years it has been about 4% per year. Indeed, Tanzania's economy was performing better than that of sub-Saharan Africa and so it seemed that things were slowly getting better in a country that was perhaps destined to become one of Africa's great hopes. And you know what? Everything was looking great until Magufuli, the current president, came to power. Because my friends, with his arrival, everything changed. Check this out. The Tanzanian Bulldozer Magafuli is known as the Bulldozer, a nickname earned during his time as Minister of Public Works. But the truth is that this name is also a fitting description of his time as President, although in this case for different reasons. Some better and some worse. For example, he inaugurated his presidency by cracking down on corruption. He removed 10,000 ghost workers from the public payroll, phantom workers who cost the country $2 million every month. Then, another very celebrated move was to integrate an albino into his cabinet, since in Africa there are many prejudices against albinos and they are persecuted by local witch doctors. But friends of visual politic don't get too excited. That is pretty much the extent of Magafuli's successes in his entire five years as leader. 
The President of Tanzania has ruled impulsively, without thinking about the consequences of each of his measures. For example, first he proposed that secondary education be free, which may sound at first to be very good. However, the immediate consequence was problematic, as the schools filled up and the situation got out of control. It's easy to promise something, but if you don't have the resources, watch out, because the cure can be worse than the disease. And that is not all. The situation of the Tanzanian educational system was definitely affected when Magafuli decreed the expulsion of all foreign workers without proper permits at the national level. This measure expelled thousands of Kenyans who'd been working as teachers. Therefore, the final outcome was doubly terrible. More students, fewer private and subsidized schools, and fewer teachers. In other words, overcrowded classes and poorer quality teaching. Then there were his economic measures. For example, the port of Dar es Salaam was a gateway to East Africa. Goods flowed through there to and from neighboring countries in the interior of the continent, such as Malawi or Zambia. Well, Magafuli wanted to take economic advantage of this situation by increasing the tax burden on all of this trade. What do you think he achieved in doing so though? The shipping companies simply changed their trade routes and now use Kenyan ports more frequently. Unfortunately, this was not the worst measure. Other economic sectors have not had the opportunity to escape so easily from the sudden changes. During the last few years, any rule of law that provides certain guarantees to investors has completely disappeared in this country. Let's just say that the abuses of the Magafuli government against foreign companies have been relentless, up to the point of creating situations like this one. Tanzania has hit a British mining company with a fine worth two centuries of revenue. Now, we all know that the exploitation of Africa's natural resources is always a sensitive issue. It's delicate because the benefit of all that wealth is hardly ever noticed locally. But this time, we are talking about a fine to the British company of Acadia Mining of no less than, hold on to your hats, $190 billion. That is roughly four times the current GDP of Tanzania. And of course, some of you may be wondering, so how on earth did the Magafuli government justify putting on all of those zeros? Well, according to their calculations, $40 billion was in arrears and the other $150 billion was in interest and the tax penalty itself. Acadia was accused of declaring less than 10% of its gold exports from Tanzania. Of course, it must be said that the company's response was fantastic. They told Magafuli, let's see, we would love your accusation to be real since, in that case, we would be exploiting the largest gold mines in the world. But it is simply not so. So, in the end, Acadia and Tanzania have agreed to settle this matter for $300 million. Meanwhile, of course, international investors have already taken note. Let's take, for example, the case of the British company Petra Diamonds that has put its diamond mine in Tanzania up for sale due to similar accusations of tax evasion. The new obstacles to foreign investment have even affected interesting projects such as the port of Bagamoyo, a mega project in which the Chinese companies involved and the Omani Sovereign Wealth Fund have just not been able to reach an agreement with the Tanzanian government. They must have plenty of capital to put up so many obstacles to foreigners, right? Basically, this is a good example of how dangerous populism can be. The fact is that the slowdown in investment flows should have had a significant impact on the Tanzanian economy. However, the official figures provided by the Magafuli government keep GDP growth above 5% per year. Of course, those numbers do not convince international organizations such as the World Bank and the IMF that things have not been going well in this country for a long time. There is simply no explanation as to how the economy can be growing while tax revenues and loans to the private sector are falling. Less technical but still very significant figures have also taken a fall, such as the sales of the country's largest brewery. I mean, come on, right? This reeks of a crisis. And then there is the apparently non-existent effect of COVID-19 on the country's economy. Magafuli declared months ago that Tanzania was free of coronavirus. Of course, news like this makes us suspect that this is not the case. It is no longer a crime to publish statistics in Tanzania, the citizen. Okay. The international pressure exerted by the World Bank has made the Magafuli government reverse the approved legislation that made it a crime to publish unofficial statistics. But hold on just one moment, because even though it is now decriminalized, the approval of the National Statistics Office is still needed in order to publish any unofficial data. So, as you can imagine, freedom of expression is not a strong point in Tanzania. Far from it. And all this repression has also reached the political opposition. In what way though? Well, let's take a look at that right now. The future of Tanzania. 
Tanzania's economic growth since its abandoned African socialism and opened up to the free market has had one key element so far – political stability. They've never faced a civil war or a military dictatorship. The country opened up to multi-party politics 25 years ago. Since then, however, the ruling party has been the same as before the multi-party system – Chama Cha Maputinzi. And I really hope that's how you say it in Swahili. Just bear in mind, mispronouncing things is my thing, I'm Scottish, I barely speak English. Translated, it means something along the lines of the party of the revolution. And don't ask me what revolution, because it's the typical party that doesn't want to change anything, and the most revolutionary thing about it is its name. So at this point, some of you are probably thinking, all right, let's hold on a minute. It's not that Tanzania was very democratic before Megafuli, but the same party has always governed? Right? And yes, yes, okay, you're right. But we are talking about a country with a defective democracy that has turned into this. Tanzania arrests opposition party leader, revokes newspaper license, Reuters. News stories like this one from June 2020 have become commonplace in Tanzania. Newspaper closures, censorship, artists banned, and even arrested. Anyone who moves against Magafuli puts themselves in the bulldozer's sights. It's the same story in the political arena. For example, live television coverage of parliamentary debates has been banned, so that criticism of Magafuli is not visible. Rallies and political demonstrations have also been banned. Disappearances of journalists critical or just even opposed to the government are the order of the day. And the violence has reached unusual levels. You only have to look at the case of the opposition candidate for the presidential elections held on October 28th. Parliamentarian Tundu Lisu has spent spent three years between Kenya and Belgium recovering from the serious consequences of the shooting he was a victim of. A shooting which, by the way, no one has ever been arrested for. Although, I think by now, we can all guess who was behind it. And that is precisely why he didn't return to Tanzania until last July. His safety is not guaranteed. And that is the main opposition candidate. <laughs> Then there's another outcome. All this repression has scared away international donors, reluctant to finance the whims of a president who puts on airs and graces. Tanzania now forced to fund its budget as donor aid freeze bites. Faced with this scenario, it is difficult to imagine an adverse electoral result for Magafuli. Five years ago, he won with 58% of the votes against 40% for the opposition party. This is the tightest result in Tanzania's short history. And so it comes down to this. The fact that it seems impossible for the opposition to have any chance of winning the election is a a real shame. And there are two reasons for this. Because political alternation is good for consolidating a democracy. Especially when Chama Cha Mupinzu has been in power for as long as Tanzania has existed. And secondly, because there is a viable alternative. The opposition, led by Jadema, has not become radical. It has not become a party desperate for the domination of Chama Cha Mupinzu or eager for revenge. On the contrary, in fact, they appear to want to follow the example of Abiy Ahmed in Ethiopia. Kadama aims to fight corruption, defending moderate centre-right approaches and a more liberal economic model. Something that, let's face it, would be very attractive to investors, and secondly, given what I have seen and the way things are, could be quite good for the country. Now, hold on one moment, because if the opposition is having a hard time in Tanzania, they are even worse off in Zanzibar. You see, Zanzibar has been in a deep crisis since the result of the regional elections was annulled five years ago, when everything pointed to the opposition winning. The violent repression suffered by the opposition supporters carried out by pro-government militias known as the Zombies is radicalising the situation. The Civic United Front, a moderate party once aspiring to co-govern Tanzania with the dominant force in Tanganyika, is being pushed to defend the right for self-determination of the Zanzibar archipelago. We'll have to wait and see what happens with the election results, but the discontent of the local population is increasing. And don't forget that we are talking about a mostly young, Muslim population, with growing unemployment due to the decline in tourism in the face of the pandemic, and a population who are already oppressed by the Tanzanian authorities. In short, here we have all of the elements necessary for Islamist extremism to prosper. And the truth is, my friends, we said at the start we like to be optimistic. We don't like having to bring up all these things about Tanzania, which is surely a wonderful country with the Serengeti and Mount Kilimanjaro. So Magafuli would do well to tone down his authoritarianism before turning a country that had been taking the right steps towards the future into an isolated, poor Tanzania that is more like his personal country estate. But now it's your turn. And today's questions are key. Do you think there should be stronger international pressure on such presidents? Or do you think it is better not to meddle in another country's internal affairs? And most importantly, will there ever be an episode where I pronounce all of the names correctly? Leave your answer in the comments. If you found this video interesting, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't done so already. And if you haven't, what are you doing with your life? Take care, and we'll see you next time.
If you want to learn more about politics and world affairs and hear some more of my lovely voice, come check out the Reconsider podcast, where we don't do the thinking for you. Find Reconsider at www.reconsidermedia.com or on Apple or Google Play or your favorite podcatcher. Thank you.